one year the term a robust capex push by the government that is supposed to spur and drive the economy but what exactly do we mean when we say capex yes it does mean capital expenditure that is the money that is collected by the government and how they choose to then spend it in their tangible or intangible assets now this means that they have a plan in place and they want to use this money be it for infrastructure railway and the likes and that's where they plan to put this money often in the budget we hear that there is an increase in outlay for this expenditure and we've seen that grow uh, quite substantially over the years in fy21 if i have to take so it was just 4.1 lakh crore last time around that was increased to about 10 lakh crore rupees and the hope is that in the 2024 budget as well, there will be some announcement that will really push this further. They're looking at a hike of anywhere close to 15 to 20%. So that is the kind of rumor that we are going around with. But let's discuss what exactly we mean by CAPEX and where the government really gets this money from firstly and how they intend to spend it through the fiscal year. And joining me to get into the details of this is Santosh Nair, our executive editor at Money Control. Thanks so much, Santosh, for speaking with us. Uh, let's get the basics out of the way firstly. We know what CAPEX is. We've heard this term often. But where exactly does this money come from? Where does the government get into the details? It, it also encompasses right from government borrowings to bonds, treasury. What all are we talking about when we just mention the word CAPEX? So there are two ways in which the government can raise money for CAPEX. Uh, one is tax revenues. And the second one is through borrowings. So these are the two major sources for the government. So when the government's expenditure exceeds that uh, of its income, that is when typically you get a uh, deficit. So in this case, uh, in CAPEX, you'll see the government spending primarily on building uh, hard assets, which is roads, ports, uh, and uh, uh, railways where there's been a significant allocation last year. These are the hard assets. Uh, this has a multiplier effect because it helps create jobs. Then there is also, it goes into building financial assets. Uh, often uh, the government uh, invests into uh, public sector undertakings. Right. Uh, besides building hard assets, it, money also goes into education, defense, healthcare. So these are some of the the broad buckets of spending under capex right so uh, who are the various stakeholders when it comes to this capex you did mention a couple of broader industries that the money really goes to but uh, give us more details and as to where all does the money first come in from as well as get spent out in there so there are three pillars of capex uh, one is household one is corporate and the third one is government which hmm. is, at this point is the biggest driver so let's examine them one by one. So when you are talking about household capex, a large part of it mainly goes into real estate. Mm. So uh, then of course you also have uh, cars and other kind of stuff, but right. a big chunk actually goes into uh, real estate. So there the trend that we are seeing right now, at least from what anecdotal evidence is suggesting, is that you're seeing very strong demand for luxury housing. So there's, there's mm. a lot of demand at the higher end uh, of the market, but uh, not so much at the affordable end. So there's, right. there's, uh, it's a mixed trend that you're seeing there. Then you have the corporate capex, which is corporate uh, expanding their capacities. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been a little slow because, uh, again, here it's uh, anecdotal uh, evidence that uh, they are a little not very certain about demand at Travel. this point of time and how the global situation will, will play out. So they've not been going about it in an aggressive manner. Yes, they are doing, uh, they are expanding capacity, but not as ag aggressively as we had seen earlier uh, during the bull market of 2007-8. Mm -hmm. So they are a little more guarded at this point in time. Right. Lastly, we have the government, which has been doing much of the heavy lifting. They've done a fantastic job. Mm. And it's not just the central government. Uh, you've also seen the state government uh, going aggressively for CAPEX. Yeah. And that also partly could have to do with the fact that the central government has been giving incentives to the state government to uh, for CAPEX spent, which mm -hmm. the state governments have been making full Music. use of. So at this point, very clearly, it's government which is doing much of the heavy lifting mm -hmm. in CAPEX. Uh, then you have corporates and lastly, household. Right. Now also let's break down this term. We often hear of uh, front-loading of this CAPEX. What 
exactly do we mean when that word is used there because people might not know this. So for the common man, what really are we talking about? So that basically means that if the government has earmarked a certain portion to be spent on CAPEX, uh, it can be done in multiple ways. Mm. Either you can spread it evenly across the budget year right. or you can spend a good chunk of it in the early part of the year. There could be many reasons for that. Mm -hmm. uh, one could be that you need to stimulate the economy immediately. Right. The other could be that probably interest rates are low mm. and you might want to, you know, take advantage of that before it starts moving up again. That's right. a key factor. That is, uh, if the government decides to spend or allocate much, it, it allocates the money. Of course, if it decides to spend that mm. uh, money during the early part of the year, then it's called front loading. Mm. Back loading is when it says that, okay, this is the amount that's been earmarked, but let's spend it towards the end of the year. Now, in this case, you have interest rates which are quite high, hmm. but they're likely to come off yeah. uh, uh, as the year progresses because uh, there is there is talk already that the Fed may cut rates and once the Fed does it, you will also have the RBI cutting rates. So interest rates clearly are set to go lower. So that could be one consideration. But lastly, uh, you must also remember that the government is running a very high uh, fiscal deficit, deficit at this point in time it will it has committed to bringing it down to about four and a half percent right now it's at five and point mm. nine percent it's committed to bringing it down to about four point five percent by fy 25 26 so okay. that that's that's a fairly stiff a target, ta target. Mm. so either you can do it by uh, increasing taxes but then the uh, if you increase taxes too much there is a chance that it could hurt demand also True. Uh, the other way is that you could cut back on some of your expenditures. That mm. is the other way. So it's yeah. not clear at this point how the what path the government may yeah. choose to take. And given the fact that we are in an uh, election here, the spending might, in fact, you know, probably push that line. And if the government does choose to be populist at this point, it might then, in fact, want to spend that money also in the later half, like how you just mentioned uh, about, you know, if they do come to power, at least that's what uh, the... Uh, consensus at this point is what it looks like. So uh, if it is that populist budget, where exactly, how would things shape up? Well, if it's a populist budget, I think there would be a fair bit of uh, allocation for rural because that is where the stress obviously seems to be. So the government mm. may have to do something there. Uh, now, in 2019, now if you look at the previous two interim budgets, one in 2014 and the other one in 2019, both were populist, actually. Mm. Uh, they are not meant to be. It, it's uh, it's not a uh, full-fledged budget actually, but right. they've been used as an ele uh, election tool first by the UPA, hmm. then the NDA, NDA also well. followed suit. So you, if you recall, uh, uh, the then finance minister Piyush Goel had raised the uh, income tax uh, uh, ceiling Re for yeah. uh, there were some rebates, rebates announced. Were announced, announced. Yes. So, uh, so there is a the the speculation here is that you could have something similar there also. Mm -hmm. Now again, but if you look on the other side, uh, the government is riding high at this point. It has won the state elections convincingly. So yeah. uh, if it is indeed certain of coming to power, then it remains to be seen whether they would decide to defer some of these SOPs instead of announcing it right now because mm -hmm. the economy is doing well. Yeah. Government's popularity is high. So you know, would they want to do something right now? this year or do it towards let's say the end of the term if they do come to power right so we'll have to wait and see what really comes out in terms of announcements as well as how the government then plans to implement it uh, eventually if they do come back to power but my final question to you is uh, regarding bonds because that also makes some part of how the government works in its function and where it gets to spend uh, there is going to be india going to be included into uh, jp morgan's uh, government bond index uh, by uh, june this year how much will that really change in fact also now uh, speculation that bloomberg too might uh, add india how much does that really make a difference to the money coming into the government's coffers? Are we looking at a good enough amount and could they really, you know, bank on something like this? So, Stacey, when uh, typically any country's bonds get included in a global bond index, uh, more global investors, international investors start looking at uh, the country. Okay. And now you also have a situation right now where India's uh, economic performance is much better than that of most other countries. Okay. So clearly there will be more interest. So what the inclusion in a bond index typically does, uh, the way it works over the longer term is that when more investors participate, which means that there's more demand for the bonds, yeah. the government will be able to raise money at a 
lower cost hmm. that's one uh, advantage secondly when you have dollars flowing in through these bonds right that will also lend a certain stability to the currency so that's the second big advantage hmm. uh, and la- thirdly you if you have currency stability and you have also lower borrowing costs then at some point it could also result in a rating upgrade Yes. Of course, none of this is going to play out immediately. Mm-hmm. These all play out over time. But these are some of the ways in which the inclusion of a country's bond in a global bond index, the way it changes the situation on the ground. Right. Santa, my final question is, uh, how much do you think there could be a change in this uh, number? We are already at 3% to GDP when it comes to CAPEX. Do you think the government would want to really take a chance and in, you know, increase that or hike this uh, uh, amount uh, for this coming uh, budget it remains to be it's still very hard to guess where uh, which way they would like to play it you know let fiscal deficit run for some more time hmm. push growth aggressively or you know the growth is comfortable enough so let's not really you know uh, try to stretch things and instead focus on the uh, fiscal deficit so it's anybody's guess i mean it, it's very hard to say stacy right so at this point we'll have to just wait for uh, Nirmala Sitaraman, the finance minister, to give us what direction she's really going to take. But come 1st of Feb, that's where we're going to get all those announcements and you should be tuning into Money Control for all of those details.